Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Mustaka's Monday webinar series. I hope you're all doing well, um, and we're really happy that you're, you're joining us today. Um, my name is Dana Duke. I'm the executive director of the Mustakas Institute. And my presentation that I'm going to give you today is how do animals in Alberta cross the road. And before we get started, um, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview for the webinar today, just some housekeeping for it. So you all, when you join today, you're all just muted by, by default and you'll all stay muted throughout, throughout the presentation, but you can use the chat box to address questions to me. Um, we all try, we'll have room at the end of the presentation um, for, for questions. And so you can put those questions in the chat box, but it'd be really great if when you do that, you could address your questions to all panelists um, and attendees, just so that everyone can see your questions. I'll make sure I repeat, you know, all the, the question that I'll be addressing, but, but um, I think people find that helpful. So I'm just going to start, for those of you who are not familiar with the Mustakis Institute, um, we are a not-for-profit charitable research institute. We hold a formal affiliation with Mount Royal University. And at Mustakis, all of our work at Mustakis is about getting information into the hands of decision makers so they can use it in support of conservation. So Mustakis has been doing this work for over 20 years. Um, we work across um, six different research thematic areas. These are the six. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing on two of those, primarily the first one, transportation and ecology. Um, and within transportation ecology, Mustakis, all of our work is really about generating awareness of the challenges that transportation infrastructure, um, primarily roads, poses pose to wildlife, and to promote workable solutions to these challenges and really trying to generate support for implementing those solutions. And I'll be touching on citizen science as citizen science is a tool that Mustakis uses um, a lot within our, our conservation work and um, we, um, we've used citizen science in, in a lot of our transportation ecology work. So in Alberta, we're really fortunate to, to live in a, in a part of the world where we have this kind of, of biodiversity and we have um, a complement of, of large mammals that we do and this slide just shows um, some of the large animals that, that we have in Alberta um, but at the same time those large mammals have to contend with this very extensive road network that we have and this is especially problematic for the types of species that um, I just had just were up on the slide is that the, a lot of those are really wide ranging mammals and they need to move a lot to fulfill their life requirements and so it's these two things together, this need to move and this road network um, that together create a problem. And it's a problem for both humans and wildlife. And so the problem is that animals have this need to, 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 to move and to move freely throughout the landscape to be able to access food and shelter um, and to find mates. But Often when they're doing that, when they're traveling throughout the, the landscape, they come, they come across roads and they have to find ways to safely cross those roads. Um, but all too often vehicles, um, wildlife come into conflict with vehicles in that they get hit by vehicles. And this is, you know, of course, very, causes very risky situations for humans. It causes direct mortality to, to wildlife. Um, in addition to mortality to wildlife, it also causes fragmentation impacts to wildlife. That as roads, more roads get, get built or, or, or highways get widened, um, it increases the fragmentation that, that wildlife are, are faced with. And it's well documented the, the negative impacts of, of fragmentation on wildlife. Um, and so, and it's not necessarily the roads themselves that are the problem for wildlife, um, although there are, you know, edge, edge effects and, and different things that come with, with the physicality of the roads being there, but it's, the problem is the cars on the roads. And so, and it's the cars that, you know, come into direct contact with wildlife. And this graph here, this just shows um, kind of as 
on the x-axis there, you have the mean traffic or the average number of vehicles per day. You can see that as vehicles on roads increase, you have this decreasing percent of animals attempting to cross the roads. So to the, to the point you get to over, you know, around 10,000 vehicles today where you see this increasing repulsion from the roads and it results in this barrier effect that then wildlife just don't try to cross the roads. It's a barrier to them. And so this has all kinds of potential population level impacts for different wildlife species. So the great thing is, is that we have a solution um, to this problem. And that, that solution is that there's different mitigations that can be done to help wildlife cross roads safely and to reduce the, the safety risk posed to humans. And that is there's overpasses or bridges that can go over top of highways. We have tunnels or underpasses that go under highways. And then we have associated fencing, which keeps um, animals off of off of the highway um, to these crossing and can direct them to these crossing structures. And there's really no better place in the world that the success of these types of structures has been demonstrated than, than in Banff National Park. This slide is from one of the overpasses in Banff and Banff has 38 wildlife um, underpasses and six overpasses. And Banff has been studying wildlife use of these for, for over 20 years. Um, and this is just a picture of one of, one of the underpasses. Um, and this has resulted in invaluable research um, from Banff and in which um, through studying the use of wildlife overpasses and underpasses, they've been able to, to demonstrate mortality rates that are 50 to 100% lower along certain sections of the highway where these overpasses and underpasses exist. And in, and, and in some case, um, sections of the highway, the mortality rates for elk have gone down to, to, to zero compared to over 100 elk vehicle collisions per year back in the mid 90s. And so Dr. Tony Clevenger has led um, much of this research, which has demonstrated the diversity of species that have used these structures um, and used them well over 200,000 times. Um, and there's been some really great research coming out of Banff that, that, that starts to, to show the different species selection for different types of structures. And this has been used um, by lots of different jurisdictions around the world as they then build, build different mitigation structures. And also demonstrating how important these structures are and reducing fragmentation to ensure genetic diversity for different species. And so from, from 2009 to 2014, Mustakas worked with Parks Canada and Dr. Clevenger to highlight the results of this research that had, has, had been going on in Banff. And Mustakas's role, our role was largely to try to take a lot of this research and communicate the results of it so that other jurisdictions in the world could become aware of it um, and start to consider it this, types, this type of mitigation for other places. And so one of the communication tools we created was a documentary film called Highway Wilding. It's a 20 minute, 22 minute documentary. And this is just the trailer for that. And I'm just going to play this here um, so you can get a sense of the, the types of communication tools that we were generating to try to wait, raise awareness for these types of tools. One of the big problems that we've had is that we have not been looking at the landscape like animals do. In face of changing climate, global warming, wildlife are going to need to expand their distributions and they're going to need structures to allow wildlife to get across these highways safely. When you look at Grizzly Bear 122, throughout this summer, he crossed the Trans-Canada Highway at least 66 times. These crossing structures were part of his daily life. We need to expand our thinking. We need to think not just about protected areas as we have in the past, but the connections in between. If you hit within a kilometer over 3.2 deer uh, annually, it's actually cost effective to mitigate with an underpass and fencing. So why aren't we doing this? Uh, 
Um, and so if, if anyone's interested, that, that Highway Wilding documentary, it's available from um, our highwaywilding.org website as well. Um, and so while there's been great success in Banff and, and, and in other places in the world with these types of mitigation, um, there's many other locations in Alberta that are, fa that are facing similar challenges with, with wildlife um, crossing road infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about some of the research that Mustakas and our partners have been doing to, to address that. And the first project I'm going to talk about is, is called Road Watch in the Pass. And um, Roadwatch um, was designed to address an important wildlife movement corridor in, in southwestern Alberta through the Crow's Nest Pass. So Highway 3 is a major transportation corridor um, and it runs through the, the low east-west elevation corridor um, that passed there from Alberta to British Columbia. It's a two-lane highway and it sees between six and nine thousand vehicles per day and it's an area that's really important for for wildlife movement for a variety of species for grizzly bears um, wolves elk deer moose um, and it's also an area that has had a lot um, has a lot of animal vehicle collisions in the, um, for, for, for a long time and so we developed roadwatch in the past um, so that we could start to generate data to, to start to look at where some of these wildlife vehicle collision hotspots were, um, where wildlife were getting hit on the road, but also where wildlife were seen successfully crossing the road. And we also wanted to engage the citizens in the Crow's Nest Pass in this, in this important dialogue, um, ultimately to see if we could then um, come up with recommend, recommendations for, for mitigation. So in order to you know, achieve our goal of, of trying to identify these hotspots, we needed to, to have the data to do that. And there was no better way to get that data than to engage the citizens. Um, these are the people that live in the past, that drive this road, drive Highway 3 every day. They had a good sense of where wildlife were getting hit. We found that when we talked to locals down there, it was really hard to talk to someone that didn't have a direct experience with, with hitting wildlife on the road. And so we used citizen science as a means to generate that data. And citizen science is, is projects in which volunteers partner with scientists to answer real world questions. And so that was the approach we used. And this is a graph to see citizen science is, um, is being used more and more. Um, this is just a graph showing peer reviewed publications that include citizen science. And this graph only goes to 2015 and you can see the exponential growth in, in citizen science. Um, and that, that curve has just continued to grow. And we use citizen science when there's a real data gap that needs to be filled. Um, but we also do it <clears throat> when there's a need to engage community as well. Um, and that's what we felt was needed in the Crow's Nest Pass. And so we developed a citizen science program where people could contribute their observations of where they were seeing wildlife cross the road. And this was actually designed before the days of, of smartphones. Um, we actually um, used an uh, online mapping tool when we did Road Watch where people could go onto a website and, and contribute where they were seeing wildlife. So this program ran for, for five years and it resulted in over 5,000 observations of wildlife along that highway. We were able to use that data um, to identify wildlife vehicle collision hotspots and do cost benefit analysis on those. And that, that data then had, has since then been used in numerous planning initiatives by local governments, um, different planning initiatives and landowners um, to, to look at um, where where these hotspots for, for for wildlife vehicle collisions are, and so this this slide talks about the cost benefit of um, mit, of different mitigations because we incorporated this into our analysis of using the road watch data. What this slide shows is that um, the average cost of hitting a deer on a highway is over six thousand dollars, and that's when you in, incorporate costs including property damage, lost hunting revenues human injury and, and human fatality. And, and you can see that these costs go up to over $30,000 um, for a deer a collision with a deer. And then this information can be used to then um, show that if you have a one kilometer stretch of highway, um, what the cost effectiveness ratio needs to be so that this is for deer. And so if you have a section of highway that receives over 3.2 deer collisions a year, 
then it becomes cost effective to put in a fence with underpass and jump outs. And so we use this in our analysis with the Roadwatch data to then come up with <clears throat> a suite of nine sites for uh, recommended for mitigation that would be cost effective. And so um, recognizing that mitigation is also costly to, to implement, we prioritize these nine and we came up with two top recommended sites for mitigation. And one was at the Crow's Nest Lakes, that's the number one site there. And this was a site that was, is really important for the movement of bighorn sheep. Um, and the other site that was prioritized is called is Rock Creek. And this is a multi-species or an area that's important for movement of multi-species for bear, bear um, cougars, wolves, elk, moose, um, and deer. And so these were the sites that we ultimately put forward as recommendations for mitigation. And, and throughout this whole process with Roadwatch in the past, we had engaged in dialogue with both Alberta Environment Parks and Alberta Transportation throughout the entire um, Roadwatch, Roadwatch program. And um, the, the, the site at Crow's Nest Lakes has been mitigated. Um, there's been fence put up there that ties to an existing bridge, um, bridge structure. And so it, this slide here, you can see these are, are bighorn sheep that are now prevented from coming onto the highway. Um, and then Rock Creek is um, um, also been identified in the provincial budget as priority for mitigation. And it's, it's currently in des design phase for that. And, <clears throat> excuse me, with Roadwatch, we had, like I said, educational goals, outreach goals, and that's one of the primary reasons for why we um, decided on uh, using a citizen science approach as well. And um, what's been really significant are the outcomes from this as well, is that we had we initiated a survey prior to Roadwatch being implemented where we asked participants about um, um, their behavior, their driving behavior, what they knew about where animals were crossing road on the highway. And then we surveyed these participants at the completion of the program. And our survey results showed that there were actual behavior changes with how, how people drove that highway. Um, and you know, we did outreach with different um, community groups and with schools. Um, this top slide is a great um, image. It was a uh, drawing contest that we held at the schools of trying to get kids to think of ideas of how they would get wildlife across the highway and they came up with some really creative, um, <laughs> creative uh, results there. And um, what's most successful I think about Roadwatch is that um, Roadwatch, even though it was, it was started by a research institute, um, um, it was a, derived around a need to collect data. Um, Roadwatch is currently um, ongoing. It's, it's a completely community-run initiative that focuses on community education and run by volunteers. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, Roadwatch has, has continued on. And this is an example of how we saw that behavior and, and, and engagement of the community is that these are people that participated in the Roadwatch program, collecting data, but they also engaged in outreach. And this is volunteers that were then painting the, the signs, warning people about wildlife. And it also resulted in community members engaging in the dialogue about this important issue and talking to their local representatives um, and writing letters, um, expressing their concern over this issue of, of wildlife movement across the road in, in the Crow's Nest Pass. And so um, it's really important when road mitigation is put in um, to monitor those mitigations so that we can understand their effectiveness. And so most monitoring um, for, for mitigation includes documenting um, animals, wildlife vehicle collisions by, by documenting wildlife that are killed on the side of the highway. And so often it's highway maintenance contractors document what wildlife have been killed on the side of the road. However, we know that many animals get struck by cars, but then they wander off the highway right away. They wander off and, and, and then succumb to their injuries. So we developed this program called Collision Count um, to better understand the relationship between um, wildlife vehicle collision data obtained by the standard methods of, of driving surveys 
and data that was obtained um, off of the highway right away so that we could start to detect and understand these unreported wildlife um, killed through the collisions. And that would enable us to then develop a correction factor that could be applied to the standard, uh, standard collect, collected method that could be applied to animal carcass data reported along road networks just so that we could obtain a more reliable um, impact estimate and, and really better understand the true cost to societies, just true cost to society, knowing that there's, you know, for every animal that we see on, on the side of the road, we know that, that more have been hit. And so we developed Collision Count. And Collision Count was a citizen science initiative. Um, we had citizens in the Crow's Nest Pass. Um, they walked transects that were aligned parallel to the highway at distances of 50, 100, and 150 meters off the highway right away um, to look for carcasses, animal carcasses. And so this program ran for four years. We had over a thousand transects walked. We were able then to compare the maintenance contractor data along the, um, that was um, animals that were hit along the road to the collision count data. And so we ran this at three different sites. We ran it at the Crow's Nest Lake where the sheep mitigation was taking place. Um, we did it at a location called Iron Ridge and we did it at Rock Creek as well. And so that, that, that bottom of that slide there just depicts a rough um, idea of, of how the transects were oriented parallel to the, to the highway. And so the results from collision count have been very interesting and they've, they've shown that the correction factor is a multiplier of 2.9 compared to the traditionally, um, how we traditionally collect road, road kill data. And so that means that like the total animal vehicle collision cost for that 45 kilometer stretch of highway from the Alberta BC border um, to Lundbrook, Alberta, uh, is over a million dollars US annually. But with the correction factor, that goes up to over $3 million. So again, it just shows that that true cost to society of, of what these animal vehicle collisions are. So we're currently um, um, writing up these results for um, submission. Um, and we feel this is a valuable contribution to road ecology is, is knowing that this, this correction factor. And so <clears throat> just gonna move on to a different example here is that um, in most cases, highway mitigation decisions are made after a highway is built. And that means that it can be costly and may result in mitigations being placed in less optimal locations um, because of engineering restraints, um, that it really is best for mitigation to be considered during the design phase of, of a highway and or during a highway upgrade. And so this is just an example of, of where mitigations are, are being considered prior, prior to um, an upgrade. So this is Highway 68 around, I don't know, this is my mouse here, this is the Trans-Canada Highway. This is Highway 68 where it turns off of the Trans-Canada Highway and links into Kananaska's country. And so, um, Mustaka's work with, with Dr. Tony Clevenger, we were asked to consider what highway mitigations um, would be needed if this Highway 60 was paved. It's currently only paved for a section of it closest when it turns off the Trans-Canada Highway, um, and, but most of that highway is still um, not paved. And so we undertook um, a study and we did a combination of methods. We did uh, road surveys during the winter, we used remote cameras, we did acoustic surveys, we did amphibian monitoring, and we did wildlife um, modeling of various species to come up with a suite of recommendations for consideration if this highway is, is ever upgraded. And we um, used all of that data, um, was compiled, and we created indices for each data type and overlaid it and, and looked at it by kilometer section. And so we were able to identify highway sections of highest conservation concern. And that's what this slide shows, so that we know which, which sections then are most important <clears throat> from, a conservation from a conservation concern. And then using that, we came up with mitigation emphasis zones, so that if the highway um, is mitigated, these um, zones would need to be thought of for different mitigation considerations. 
So this is just an example of where it really is um, advantageous to be you know, thinking about mitigation prior to um, a highway upgrade. So just gonna switch gears here to another initiative that MISDACUS is undertaking with a number of partners. Um, and this was a program that was developed to address a specific species of, of conservation concern, that, that being um, pronghorn. Um, pronghorn are, they're provincially listed as um, sensitive in Alberta, um, and they're a migratory species that really rely on a, a really highly connected landscape in order to, to survive, um, and that, Every fall and spring, pronghorn, they migrate um, between summer and, and winter ranges. And that movement can be between Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana. And um, research that's been conducted um, by Alberta Conservation Association and the University of Calgary and Alberta Environment Parks, they've shown that you know, some pro uh, pronghorn travel to 400 kilometers between their um, from winter range and then and, and even over 800 kilometers over, over the course of a year and so that amount of movement in these types of landscapes um, really results in um, you know coming across different obstacles um, and this slide here shows those those um, migration corridors that have been documented by corridor this is through some of Andrew Jake's work um, um, work and but this is when you think about it also from the, the highway network perspective you get a, 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 an understanding of the types of obstacles that these pronghorn are, are faced with and um, researchers have, have documented the barrier effect of roads with pronghorn through collared pronghorn demonstrating how how some pronghorn will stay on one side of a highway for up to days as they kind of can um, navigate how they're going to cross these busy highways like the trans canada highway that, that goes through these migration routes and so and, and research has shown that pronghorn prefer overpasses um, and very strongly prefer them and so knowing that Overpasses are, are expensive mitigations. It's really important to know the most effective area for an overpass to be placed. And so that's why we developed um, pronghorn crossing and it had a number of, of objectives. One was to, to really validate these um, pinch points of movement that had been identified through Dr. Andrew Jakes. He developed pronghorn connectivity models. And so we wanted to validate those using citizen science generated data. Um, and we can use that information then to create a business case for pronghorn, um, um, putting in pronghorn mitigation and, and ultimately to, to build a community of support, trying to really elevate this within um, the communities so that we can justify an investment and, and the importance of pronghorn conservation. This is a multi-partner initiative um, with Alberta Conservation Association, um, the Alberta government, the Saskatchewan government, the Saskatchewan government insurance, and Nature Conservancy Canada, and the National Wildlife Federation. Um, and like I mentioned, this is a citizen science initiative where we really wanted to engage citizens who are driving the highways to document where they're seeing pronghorn adjacent to the highway and where they're seeing pronghorn getting get hit on the highway. And so this initiative allows citizens to participate in two different ways. They can participate using a smartphone application or they can submit their observations of pronghorn using an online mapping tool. And this just gives a sense and we of course only promote people using the smartphone application if they are a passenger in, um, in a vehicle. And so this is just what the, the um, smartphone application looks like. And it was modeled after um, a program we worked on um, called Roadwatch BC, which um, Mastakis was involved in. And it, this program was modeled after that. And so this is what the smartphone application looks like. And so you can see it's very simplified. Um, you can see the, that you just submit an observation. You could then ask, prompt you to say what the animal looked like. And then you can say if the animal was um, dead, alive, beside the highway or crossing the highway and just how many you can see. Um, but I, what I really wanna point out here is on this first image of the mobile app, you can see a button that says start a route. 
Um, and one of the biggest limitations with citizen science data is that it's often just observational data. It's presence, absence. And we're limited in, in how we can analyze that data because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, because it doesn't tell, um, doesn't tell us anything about effort, about how long we were out there before we saw an animal, or it doesn't give a sense of zero values of when you didn't see an animal. And so you're limited in, in what you can, and how you can use that data in different analysis. And so we created this function within the smartphone app where participants can can drive a route. So when they would they get in their car, they would hit start route. And then this just runs in the background um, as they're driving. And so that they, they would just then as normally submit when they saw um, different species. But then that then information is then tied to this route that we know that they drove. And so we can use that information to do much more in-depth analysis because it gives us an idea of effort of how much time someone was out there before they saw um, an animal. And so it just gives us more options in how we can analyze this, this data. And so these are some preliminary results. Um, this pronghorn was launched in 2017 um, and we, there's been 220 participants that have reported observations um, with over just under a thousand observations. Um, and you can see that that we have had people participating in these driving these routes, um, which is great. And so, and you can see here that we that the observations are are predominantly pronghorn. <clears throat> And so we'll be using these results um, and that the first objective was to compare them then to these pinch points that have been identified with connectivity modeling. And so this is the connectivity model developed, sorry, by um, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Jakes. And you can see um, just where I'm moving my mouse right now, this is the Trans-Canada Highway. And so you can see these areas in yellow. They're the highest connectivity value across the highway. And so we'll be able to then come compare the pronghorn data to that, 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 that connectivity model. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so for, for this, this is where the, um, the connectivity model has been um, given, a, a, attributed a mean value per kilometer road section. Um, so that, that the, the highways have been divided into kilometer sections, and then we're able to take the mean value for each of those kilometer sections and attribute it to a value between zero and one, so we index it. And then we can do the same thing for pronghorn observation, um, and then we can sum those, sum those two indices together. And the red areas that you see on there are where those have the highest level of agreement between the two indices. It's the top 20%. And so this is really important um, and it really starts the having really important, allows us to start to have a dialogue about where there's agreement between where you're seeing pronghorn and where um, pronghorn observations or pronghorn that um, seem get hit on the road as well um, and connectivity models. And, and it also speaks to the importance of, um, of fine scale data as well. And this, here, this slide shows where the areas where you have agreement in red, but areas where there's high connectivity values, but then areas in yellow sh showing high pronghorn crossing values. And so you can see there are some areas of alignment and some areas where, where they don't align. align. And it really speaks to the importance of, of fine scale data and that context um, specific information is really important. Um, and this map that will be updated um, um, at the end of the, the, the program a couple years to provide recommendations for mitigation because this is really just also the start of the dialogue in that this tells us where there's alignment between connectivity models and um, observational data or um, or roadkill data, but it doesn't tell us anything about land ownership, which is a very important consideration on either side of the road. It doesn't talk about where Alberta transportation is already considering upgrades in the future. Um, it doesn't take into account um, engineering, like where it's even possible to mitigate the highway. So these are all um, then important things that become part of, part of, part of the conversation. Um, but, Knowing the limitations in the ability to invest in mitigation, um, 
there is a need to talk about the integrations of, of, of these types of data that we can't be looking at just connectivity models in isolation um, that allows us um, just lends to a more confident understanding of the best strategies for for mitigation and so while we can address each highway um, separately um, there's also a need to be looking at the entire transportation network because this is the scale at which transportation agencies make decisions. Um, how they make decisions about upgrades, how they make the budget allocations. Um, and faced with limited budgets, it's important that we prioritize um, the, the needs for, for mitigation. And so Ms. Dacus undertook this network approach together with Dr. Adam Ford from UBC Okanagan campus and Tyler Creech from the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. And we worked with Alberta Transportation and Alberta Environment Parks um, <clears throat> to really look at this um, kind of more for all of Southern Alberta, this highway network perspective um, where we could identify priority road segments that will improve wildlife movement and reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. And so <clears throat> there are a number of different objectives for this. One was to identify highway sections with high connectivity value. And this was done taking a multi-species approach. There were four different focal species. We looked at pronghorn, rattlesnake, mule deer, and grizzly bear. Um, we predominantly used you know, existing data for these species to develop um, functional connectivity models and we also developed um, uh, structural connectivity kind of a, a species neutral structural connectivity model as well for this for the study area but then we also were interested in the identification of high highway sections with high risk of animal vehicle collisions um, and for that um, RCMP data a collision data was used with provincial um, um, data as well and that's what's traditionally been used by transportation agencies to identify hotspots of animal vehicle collisions. Um, and however, there's, there's big gaps in that data um, as well. But recently, this data has improved um, greatly due to the implementation of a province-wide partner, uh, sorry, a province-wide program called Wildlife Watch developed by Alberta Transportation, which collects and analyzes data on animal vehicle collisions. And this, is, this program is going to greatly enhance um, the animal vehicle collision data across the entire province. Um, and so this project that was then was really interested in looking at where these two conditions intersect, where we have high connectivity value and where we have high risk of animal vehicle collisions um, and looking at prioritizing those sections of highway. And the prioritization of those highway sections <clears throat> um, was done through the development of different scenarios. And so this allows transportation agencies to kind of, to use this tool from a planning perspective where you can look at different scenarios ones in which you may favor um, um, favor protecting human risk or ones in which you may favor wildlife connectivity um, and then you can generate weights for each of those indexes based on how you prioritize them but then you can look at how that then changes your prioritization and how you can integrate that into your pl into planning and so um, this, this initiative also took on um, really the importance of multi-departmental engagement by the government of Alberta. And this was really key. Um, and I, it's something that, that's really important, recognizing that Alberta transportation is mandated to address motorist safety. Um, um, they're, they're not mandated for the protection of biodiversity. However, Alberta Environment Parks is mandated to manage biodiversity. So it's, it's really important to engage the government agencies um, together so that they can both be achieving you know, what they're mandated to do. And these are the results of this initiative and so what this slide shows is on, on the, the left two left hand maps these are the st structural connectivity model and the bottom one is the rattlesnake connectivity model and this just shows the um, um, the resulting um, structural connectivity index along the road network 
And this is just really important because it's important to be able to take you know, wildlife conductivity models and put it in a context that's valuable to transportation agencies. And this just allowed us to look at then how this plays out along the, the, the highway network. And then we took then the, those, those structural connectivity indices um, and compared them to the animal vehicle collision indices. And this is where we overlaid these indices and to look at where there was alignment. And so it's that bottom right hand corner where you can see the results of the structural connectivity index and the animal vehicle collision index overlaid to show the top 10% of alignment. And you can see that there's actually you know very limited places where there's where there's a where there's alignment and this demonstrates then that just you know the the difference between addressing just connectivity or just animal vehicle collisions um, that <clears throat> we're not necessarily addressing the needs of both um, or, 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 or needs of, of, of one are being are not being addressed if you're looking at just one and so this has led to different lessons learned through, through these initiatives that I think are important for the field of transportation ecology and for, you know, as we think about wildlife connectivity and animal vehicle collisions and how we address those. And so that is, is one, just what I mentioned just previously is that, you know, provincial transportation and environment department, they're very different mandates, um, but it is um, possible that both can benefit from road mitigation and we really have to be thinking about how we integrate the needs of both into these initiatives and how we think about and talk about um, mitigating highways and that standardized road indices for animal vehicle collisions and connectivity both need to be developed to enable the systematic identification of road sections um, for mitigation that's appropriate for for transportation departments operational scale it needs to be context specific to how transportation departments have to manage their highways. And road sections with the highest animal vehicle collisions and high structural connectivity val values don't align very well. And we saw that, well, we're seeing that with the pronghorn work and we saw that with the Alberta um, network approach as well. And something that, that we've learned at Mistakis through a lot of these different approaches is, is how valuable citizen science can be. Um, it's not a silver bullet, but it can play a really significant role. And that engaging citizens, you know, we, we've seen the value of that in our, our road watch initiative um, and, and, and in Pronghorn as well, is that it can be a really valuable tool to fill a data gap and engage citizens in, in really important dialogues. We've also learned how important it is to engage decision makers really early on in these processes that um, we need to hear about what the needs are of decision makers um, across different agencies, across different levels of, of decision making as well. Um, and that the information that we that we're able to generate it has to be available to to, to in, in, in a format that's that's useful and helpful to decision makers. And again, that example can be shown like with the, uh, it's not necessarily helpful just to be um, um, providing transportation planners and decision makers with connectivity models of wildlife. It needs to be in a, in a format that's useful to actual transportation planners. Um, and that the scale of data has to match the scale that the decision's being made. Because um, sometimes you have these, you know, very local decisions being made about a very site-specific mitigation, but at the same time, then we have entire transportation agency that's making decisions across the entire province. And we need to be able to think about the scale at which decisions are being made and what's uh, important, appropriate information to be brought into that dialogue. Um, and that we all know that road mitigation for wildlife is expensive. Um, we're not possibly going to be able to mitigate everything that um, probably needs needs to be mitigated and that therefore we need to prioritize we need to be knowing where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck um and that traditional approaches um, to planning for road mitigation really have focused on these areas of high animal vehicle collisions and they really haven't taken into account the needs for wildlife connectivity 
and we're showing that these don't necessarily overlap but we need to find ways to integrate both um, so that you know ultimately we're, we're providing the best for for um, human safety and for wildlife movement and this is especially important in the context i think of you know other places in the world as well that you know there's a lot more roads to be built um and i think a lot of places in the world can 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 learn from these types of initiatives on how best to be thinking about how we mitigate roads um th that um like Lynn, like i mentioned before even in the in the design phase and lastly i just really like to um thank our funders um and this is actually you know i think it's really important to just recognize that at Mistakis with our partners, we've been really fortunate to have funders who recognize how long some of this work takes. And we've had some of these funders on this list have funded us working on um, the same initiative for, for over a decade. And without that kind of support, we wouldn't be able to engage in this the way that we've been able to. And so that wraps up my presentation. I'm really happy to take some questions. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and I can get them from there. Um, and I wanna end by saying that um, Mistakas, we've been host, have host these weekly webinars. So they, the topics vary every week. And we put the, the presentation up on our webinar page on our website. So you can access the webinar from there. And also the upcoming webinar for the next week is also advertised there. So you can register there as well. So this is um, just the website for our Mistaka's website where you can access that. Is right there. And this is my contact information. Although, um, don't call, phone the office number because I'm not there. <laughs> um, it, best to reach me by my email. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I have a question here that says, um, I think everyone can see it. I may have missed this at the beginning, but what was the smallest species in the studies you've referenced? Um, well, for most of the, um, um, most of them, they're, they're, they've mostly been large mammals. Um, but the, the interesting thing is when we did um, our citizen science initiative, like with Roadwatch in the past, um, it was interesting because a lot of the participants were really interested in in documenting um, birds and um, weasels and um, that's those were those we were interested in, in um, we weren't analyzing that data but we were getting lots of contributions of, of those species for the work we did um, on highway 68 we actually did amphibian um, surveys so we were doing frogs and toads um, we were we did acoustic surveys as well where we were documenting birds so um, but for the for most uh, most of the studies have been for large mammals but the but sorry for the network analysis for the Alberta conductivity um, tool that we developed uh, one of our local species was rattlesnake and I have a question here. So if transportation has just planned using animal vehicle collisions and the priority is moving to use both animal vehicle collisions and connectivity concerns, is connectivity on the radar with same priority yet? Does it have to be only a benefit with both to be built? Um, well, that was the whole purpose of us uh, undertaking this, this kind of network perspective was to try to um, bring connectivity into the dialogue and, and, and we're continuing that right now. And so we've been talking with Alberta Environment Parks about how we can try to ensure that connectivity needs are being part of the dialogue um, as Alberta Transportation um, ha um, have these conversations and considerations for um, mitigations in the future.
Um, and there was one other question that was just wondering how costs are determined please. And so um, actually there's a lot of research, there's a, a number of papers that have addressed this um, and um, in terms of like, I think you're referring to the cost I put up about like personal injury and hunting, lost hunting revenues and whatnot. And um, um, Chris, I have, I have the publication that I can point you to. Actually, I think some of those, that research is actually currently being updated right now with some updated costs. And I think even the numbers I've included here, like they're, they're quite dated now. And so I think there's new research that's being done to, to update that as well. Well, I, oh, I don't see any other questions coming through. So I just want to, um, oh, yes. Did, did you get the note on correction factors? Maybe I missed that. Is that just please do publish? Yes, we're in the process of doing that right now. So hopefully we'll be able to get that information out for, um, for broader consumption soon. So thanks everyone, thanks for joining us and I hope we can have you back again for our future Mustakas webinars. Have a good day everyone.